And now uh, our European Venture Capitalist Roundtable with uh, Mike Butcher, who is the editor of TechCrunch Europe, Eric Archambault of Wellington Partners, Sonali de Ricker, I, I am sure, I hope I pronounce it well, from Axel Partners, and Albert Ganyushin, the head of international listings of uh, um, New York Stock Exchange, or Euronext. Wow. How are you? Hello, Louis. Good to see you. It's good to see you again. Here we are at the web. Fantastic. Eric, Sonali. How did I pronounce good. really bad? You know, you know, I'm Indian, and even I can't pronounce Hi. it. It's my husband's name. How do, but how do you pronounce it? I say the Raika. He says the Rika. Oh. It was good. Well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Butcher. I'm actually editor at large of TechCrunch. I don't know what happened to the European editor. We had him bumped off. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Thank you for joining us for our panel. We're going to be talking about something which concentrates the minds of many entrepreneurs. Uh, that's money. And uh, what do we do with it? How do we get it? And, uh, and how do we make more of it? Um, our, uh, I'm joined by Eric Archambault, a general partner with Wellington Partners, to my left. Then uh, Sonali de Rijka, who is a partner with Axel Partners. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these firms. And Albert Ganyashin, who is the head of international uh, listings at Euro Next. Let's talk about um, where we are at the moment. Probably, if you looked at the venture capital industry five years ago, it was quite different, really, wasn't it? It was uh, you had some um, some fairly big players, but um, a lot of um, sort of there were bits in the ecosystem which hadn't yet been filled out. But now we've got quite a lot of um, firms like ourselves who are investing in a pan-European. Capacity, um, Sonali, you, your, your, your feeling is you're quite upbeat at the moment, aren't you? Yeah, I think it's a great time. I think it's a great time to be an entrepreneur. There are lots of uh, places to access talent as well as money. And I think the, the important thing about this cycle versus the last cycle is that people are believers. And the entrepreneurs that we're seeing, they really are inspired globally by the stories they're hearing. There's no arbitrage in information anymore. There's never been... Uh, and monopoly on innovation in Silicon Valley. And people feel like they can get to market, they can hire talent, and it's actually achievable. It's still a long way to go. I mean, give, compared to where we were 10 years ago, we've, uh, we've come very far. And uh, the, you know, the availability of technology, of infrastructure, 10 years ago, people were worried about how to figure out bandwidth, how to figure out hosting, what would be the platforms they would have to use. Now, the entrepreneurs, they focus on the one thing they can do really well. The rest is out there as a service, and the capital is uh, much more available. It's a really good time. One of the things that has, been, has <coughs> started to emerge is how European VC firms have started to um, uh, very much concentrate on looking at that pipeline between Europe and the, and the Valley. Um, I know it's something that you've, uh, right. uh, Wellington has been um, a champion of both Wellington and Axel and many other firms, but um, I mean, do you think that's, uh, that remains an important uh, strategy? Well, for us, it's the uh, central strategy. You know, we really look for entrepreneurs in Europe that have global ambitions and um, Global still today, fortunately or unfortunately, means you, go, you need to go to the U.S. very quickly. If you don't win the U.S. market quickly, you are not going to be the, the global champion. So going from Europe to the U.S. early enough has become very, very important, central to our strategy again. But it used to be very difficult because exactly like Sonali said, you used to have to worry about the platform, whether you know, you'll be compatible, you, you, whether you'll, you'll have to develop you know, partnerships from the get-go in the US, and that was very difficult to do from Europe. What has changed today is that you can test um, your product or your service in a small market in Europe, say Scandinavia, and then burst into the US market very quickly. I suppose um, the, probably the best example of that is Spotify, where uh, really they were quite under the radar uh, in Sweden for a long time and then managed to scale internationally quite quickly and, and of course, launch in the US. Um, where are the gaps, though? I mean, um, one of the criticisms of the European venture market is often that uh, European companies are typically underfunded compared to their US counterparts. Um, 
Um, how important do you think that is uh, as an issue going forward, or do you feel that they don't need to raise nearly so much because uh, perhaps talent is, is more affordable to some extent? Um, uh, and, and the other thing is, and, and let's talk, so, talk also about um, Series A financing and follow-on fun, funding. Um, what, what do you think, Sonali? You know, we certainly don't see the underfunding. Candidly, I think, you know, we're a, our, fund, our fourth fund that was raised in January of this year is 475 million. It's very much, um, we are very much early stage investors, and that's a typical fund size for venture capital in, you know, in the US. And so as we think about what is the appropriate way to finance a company from cradle to the end and to success, uh, you know, we do it exactly the same way in, um, in, in, in Europe, Europe as we do it in Silicon Valley. So uh, we do large Series A financings of the model and the entrepreneur and kind of the global market ambition warrants it. I do think that uh, those are probably the chosen few. I think there are a few entrepreneurs that get multiple term sheets. They sort of have the market um, at their fingertips in terms of what they want to do. So yeah, it's not a blanket statement. There will be, there will be some entrepreneurs who can't raise as much. And I think uh, you know, we're kind of a right-sized market at the minute in terms of uh, European venture. Yes, there should be a little bit easier access to capital, probably kind of between the friends and family and the, and the Series A. But we're not seeing the underfunding. I mean, we're seeing the ambition of these entrepreneurs, and they're raising quite a lot compared to averages of you know, five years ago, and that, would, that versus five years before that. Do you think, though, that there should be, um, you know, that one of the perhaps one of the problems is is the lack of um, there should be more competition off the term sheets between uh, venture firms. That uh, if we had more venture firms, that therefore there would be more competition, and therefore entrepreneurs would be uh, perhaps better served. Do you think? What do you think, Eric? Well, there, there are certainly less venture firms in Europe than in Silicon Valley. You have like 400 firms in a tiny little area. Um, but that being said, I think the, the market is fairly well served now in uh, locally and then pan-European. Um, I, I like to be a bit challenging to the entrepreneurs. I think four or five years ago, a number, there was a lot of entrepreneurs coming up with ideas and they were not necessarily, the combination of the ideas and the team and their ability to deliver the, uh, the story may not have been as good as they are today. And they were certainly not as good as a number of other companies being started in Silicon Valley or in New York. And so were there at the time a Series A, you know, a, a lack of, of funding for Series A? Maybe not, maybe there was a bit less quality than there is today. Today it's not the case anymore. What we are seeing is a, a really, really high quality deal flow um, and better than what we, we, we saw a few years ago. And, and, and the results are there also in terms of fundraising. Um, so both Sonali and I have been involved in, in sometimes the same companies, sometimes competing on, on some co companies. But Series A of um, 12 million a few months ago for Y Plan, which we did the seed funding a few months before that. They went to uh, after the US market. That's not something you were seeing um, 10 years ago. Same thing for Supercell. That's not what you were seeing 10 years ago. Yeah, you're nodding your heads now. Yeah, we put 8 million euros in in the Series A of Supercell when the company had just barely got off the ground and uh, it was a bold move. But you know, for, it was a gaming company that uh, people might know was eventually, we sold half our stake uh, to Supercell, uh, to SoftBank for an enterprise value of three billion. And really there we believed in the team and we knew that once it worked, um, they would be very cash flow positive. But the reason we funded them with that much capital when there wasn't a lot there at the minute other than an exceptional team was really we wanted them to be able to pivot and pivot and pivot and that's exactly what they did. And that required trust and that required confidence. And so I do think for the great companies, there's a level playing field between Europe and Silicon Valley. That's why you have the Spotify's, the Rovio's, the Supercell's, uh, the ClickTex, which is a Swedish company that went public on, uh, uh, in the US that, that we invested in very early. Um, Criteo that just recently went public. There's some great examples of uh, European companies that have really made it to the global stage and never had a funding history that was that much different from the US. And of course, it's only it's a smaller number, and that's because it's a smaller market. 
20 years later, it's going to be a bigger market because it's a lot different than it was 15 years ago. Um, I'm doing my best to get, get some black views out of these VCs, but you're being relentlessly upbeat. Uh, so uh, as, a, as the cynical journalist, uh, British journalist that I am, I'm going to have to turn now to you, Albert. And we, you, we were heard just now about uh, Criteo's um, IPO, uh, we, King.com, of course, there as well. There's um, a couple of others um, uh, coming up in the near, near future. Uh, with um, Euronext, I mean, one of the... Um, one of the constant, often cr uh, sort of fairly, fairly uh, regular criticisms of the European market is that we don't have a, a sort of a big tech market like the NASDAQ for European companies to float on. Now, obviously, and I'm not going to be too harsh on you because it's quite early days uh, for Euronext, um, but what, where, why do you think that is and how do, we think, how do you think we can change that? Well, it's difficult because... In the U.S., and, and by the way, NYAC now is the leader in U.S. tech IPO, yes, so uh, indeed. Uh, for the last um, helped two years. By, helped by a few mistakes. Yeah, yeah. so, but, but, but in the last two years, NYAC now is the, uh, is the destination, and, and NICE Euronex group operates that, that platform. So actually, sitting in Europe, we can see very clearly what is happening in the European space. And, uh, you know, for sure, from the European perspective, we would like to see, and everyone, I'm sure, in the ecosystem would ideally like to see European companies going public in Europe. The fundamental difficulty, of course, is the sheer depth of the U.S. market, generally, in terms of capital markets, and specifically when it relates to the technology space. And it, you know, frankly, it boils down to the number of analysts you're going to get following you, the number of specialized funds, the, the competition uh, uh, from the buy side to come into these companies, etc. And I think what it means in practice is for a certain size and type of company, larger companies, um, at the moment, U.S. Um, most of the time is the preferred option, uh, simply because the valuation arbitrage, real or perceived, is so significant. So, uh, in this context, I think we will continue to see larger transactions from Europe um, going to the US. Uh, and as you said, you, men you mentioned King.com, you know, they are apparently considering a listing in the United States and a few others. So, uh, w but what do we do about it, I guess, is the yeah, question on the that European was my next side. Question, yeah, yeah. Because How can you change that scenario? Because obviously, you know, we spend our daily lives trying to make both markets work as effectively yeah. as we possibly can. So, I think on the Euronext side, um, we, uh, you know, the way we think about it is, is the, 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 the ecosystem needs to grow and support these companies, essentially, right? So, I think there's no other way around it is to come together and start to build something on top of something. And, 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 and the way to do this, really, in my opinion, is to focus on uh, slightly under the U.S. threshold kind of company, larger companies. So, we, you know, we've seen this uh, kind of working quite well on the life sciences side, to give you an example, right, on Euronext. Now, Euronext uh, runs on about 10 IPOs in the life sciences sector, uh, you know, for the last three years. So that tells you that... Some, some way or another, this market is working, okay? So, mm -hmm. and of course, it's you know, a little bit of hit and miss because they're smaller companies. They tend to be your 150s, your 200s, 250s. But if they are the right companies to come to market, and that is all about you know, being able to deliver the financials, grow, et cetera, predictable growth, then you know, they kind of double in size in a, in, a year, in a year or two. So they become larger. So, Therefore, from our perspective, this, this is kind of the only way to get this market back up again. Yeah? So because I think it's difficult to compete for larger deals. What does it mean in practice? I think in practice it means we need to create conditions where people at the sm slightly smaller but larger SME rent yeah, are prepared to use European markets to raise capital. And a lot of the entrepreneurs are deterred by the, the difficulties, the regulatory environment, this, the this, you know, the concerns, etc. So I think what exchanges such as ourselves are doing uh, are trying to uh, invest together with partners in programs that help companies get comfortable with that. And, uh, is and, there and bring them to market and make easy, you know, feel, feel, feel better about it. No? Is it a sort of a chicken and egg scenario whereby there needs to be more analysts to, to help the market, or is it just more companies that will create more analysts? 
I think more analysts is a difficult question because the, 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 the way the, the capital markets are set up, equity research basically doesn't pay for itself. So you cannot right. just going to generate equity research coverage out of nothing. Yeah? So let's get. So I think it's down to building the ecosystem. It's down to having, you know, not only guys like this that are operating, I guess, on the larger side of the VC market, but also all the different ones, you know, everyone together you... educating, I guess, uh, uh, you know, the investors, the, uh, the, the ecosystem, and, you know, frankly, invest in time, you know. So we have programs now at Euronext where we, you know, uh, created Enternext, for example. It's, it's an entity specifically dedicated to the SME market. And, right? you, and you were in re fairly regular contact with, you know, the Axels and the Wellingtons of this world? Yes, of course we are. Of yeah. course we are. Um, but I think it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's also about, frankly, sometimes competing, right? You know, so a company would have a choice sometimes, you know, in this, you know, serious C funding, uh, serious C funding, perhaps as an alternative, it can use the IPO market. I think it's about picking the right companies in that, you know, your 300, 400, 500 million market cap dollars type of companies that can use perhaps uh, on an, you know, on an occasion, and as, as often as, as possible, European market to get on the capital market stage, want, because then we can build on top of that. I want to, I want to cover off a couple more topics before we, uh, we, we, we run out of time. Which is first, but one, this is one, a big one, topic. I mean, you want to ask a dark area. The dark area is that yeah. we just don't have the frequency of liquidity that people take for granted in the U.S. Right. Both on the acquisition side, you know, in the, the M&A, the, the volume that happens in the U.S., the fact that you have sub-$100 million exits, sub-$300 million exits, and even more, and of course the bigger ones we're all aware of, on a regular basis, that begets the ecosystem. There are entrepreneurs that go back in and out of the system, and of course the IPO market, supply, demand, I don't think it's a supply issue, there are great companies here, but yeah, something has to get the ecosystem going, and it's a lot about the sell-side research. But I, I presume that's exactly what I wanted to ask you. I <laughs> presume you, is, you think that because there's going to be some big ones over the next couple of years, companies like Supercell, well, Supercell we've already seen, uh, Wooga, for instance. Um, uh, so, sorry? Spotify. Spotify, big the elephant in the room. Um, that over the next couple of years, that will start possibly start kick-starting that liquidity engine. If the, if the decision's made to be, yeah, in Europe. The problem is that, you know, I think there are great examples of companies like ASOS and even companies like Ukes that went public, uh, you know, in Milan. But it took a long time for the buy side and for the analyst community to really buy into that stock. We don't have the, that sort of time. Oh. These companies are, move, want to move too fast now. Right. But I, I hope it will be a little bit easier going forward because, you know, a lot of the companies that have come to market in Europe in the past, you know, they kind of had their ups and downs and so they've disappointed the market on an occasion. And yeah, so, that wasn't a good idea. And, First earnings call. Yeah. And so, and so, and, and, and by the way, it happens in the US, you know, 40, 30, 40% 40 of the companies listing in the US miss their first quarter numbers. So it does happen, but it's just, I guess, you know, a slightly better looking overall picture because of the, you know, the sheer numbers of IPOs, you know, 50 tech IPOs year to date in the United States. But I think what we, uh, what we'd like to see is, as I say, companies uh, from the digital space using the European market because the digital companies a lot more often have small tick size and their revenue, they're a lot more predictable. They, you know, there's a subject to them being interested genuinely in the capital markets, there is an opportunity to build from there. Quick, um, a slightly different subject. Um, we've seen the rise of some pretty big pan-European firms uh, out of London, um, covering off deals in uh, Northern Europe, uh, France, um, Germany, Scandinavia. Uh, why, is, wh why does there seem to be sort of a gap in Southern Europe amongst, um, you know, big, big VC firms coming out of Southern Europe and, and big plays coming out of there? Does anyone have an answer for that? I feel like the Frenchman answer. No. In London, yes. Um, well, I think it's it's question of, of uh, we, we see a number of great entrepreneurs from Italy and Spain. They I mean, tend uh, to have mo Barcelona was once talked about as the next Berlin, for instance. Yeah, but they they tend to look for an ecosystem which is a bit more supportive than what they have in their own country, and it's going to come at some point. But you need a critical mass of engineers and product managers and people that you can exchange with when you are an entrepreneur. I mean, I, the guys who are here know that very well. You are both competing all the time with your other startup companies, but you're also um, exchanging best practices. And if you are by yourself or um, 
you know, almost by yourself in a, in, a, in a town, whether it's Milano or Madrid, and you only have five or six other startups around you as opposed to a thousand startups in Berlin, the ecosystem is clearly not the same. So it's a question of ecosystem to me, not a question of quality of entrepreneurs. So we need more coffee shops with Wi-Fi and co-working and, and uh, lots and lots more clusters, I suppose, to develop. And also the social acceptation for being a young entrepreneur. You know, if I'm out of the best school in a country and all my peers are going to consulting or banking or you know, a more traditional uh, big company, it's not very conducive for starting a company. That, that has broken down in Europe, this, in Northern Europe. In Sweden right now, in Finland right now, it's amazing the amount of, of um, you know, personal satisfaction you get for being an entrepreneur. So you actually are encouraged to be one. Yeah, and I can, uh, and I think we also also include Russia in this. We just did TechCrunch Moscow in Russia, and there's some some big firms developing there, like Almaz and Runa Capital, and uh, and and, and there's some some really interesting things going on there. So they're really doubling down on on their ecosystem as well. Um, Another quick topic before we, we, we can wrap, uh, which is crowdfunding. So crowd equity, for instance, ca raising capital on, uh, right via the crowd, as it were. Uh, we've seen uh, Cedars in the UK uh, mm -hmm. become a crowd equity platform trying to launch across Europe. Uh, there's Crowdcube. There's, there's, wh what do you guys think, especially in the VC world, do you think about these? Do you encourage uh, your entrepreneurs to, to look at, towards that? Uh, or do you, are you con concerned about it? Do you feel you'll, you'll, you'll be replaced by crowdfunding one day or not? What do you think? Well, I'd, I'd like to take the analogy of you know, competitive running, for example. If you, if you are a country and you are trying to develop a national team to compete in the Olympics, you really want to go deep down into the, you know, all the schools and everywhere else to get trainers to scout for, for new talent and help them get to a certain point. I think crowdfunding is fantastic for that. It really helps a number of entrepreneurs get off the ground, you know, come up with a, a new idea, a new product, a new service, try it out. And if they really want to go to the, um, to the Olympics, which is you know, competing in the world globally against the guys from Silicon Valley and Japan and China, you may want to have a couple of people on your board that are going to you know, speak with one voice and, and really guide you to, uh, to success, which is very difficult to obtain with a very heterogeneous group of people. There's a good reason why through Darwinian process over 30 years, the form of venture capital with firms and partners who are complementary and so on, but have the same common interest to make it work emerge, and I think there are some good reasons still to that. What do you think, Sonali, about crowdfunding? I, I actually think it's potentially uh, an alternative to, and also potentially quite disruptive to kind of friends and family, business angel, and then potentially even early stage Series A funding. Um, but in many ways, like all disruptions that happen to sort of incumbents, where the incumbent in this case, it expands the market. You know, it encourages entrepreneurship, it encourages capitalism, and you know, it allows people to chase the dream, and by God, is that good, especially in areas of Europe. I mean, we've seen companies in Armenia and in Lithuania, one of my, our most recent investments is in, from Vilnius. It's not obvious that even the first-rate entrepreneurs from these regions can really have access to a business angel. I mean, there's that clusters are barely in formation. For these kinds of individuals, this is a fantastic alternative. But as Eric says, does it replace proper venture capital, which is about the connections and about the support. I don't think so, because what goes up comes down, then goes up again, and then it pivots, and then it repivots. I mean, you know, the journey of a startup, Twitter didn't start up, it's Twitter, right? It's really a long and difficult road. And to have a hundred or thousands of different investors that you got to manage and tell the story is a nightmare. So I think it will play a role. I think it'll expand the market. I think it's actually really exciting. But I don't think it takes people like us out of the business. At least not in my lifetime. <laughs> so, um, very briefly, we've only got a minute left, but uh, um, what's, your, what's your general statement about uh, VC over the next, for instance, let's, let's take a five-year five year window for the next, next five years. What, what do you think, uh, Albert, and funding? Um, I, I, think, uh, I think the whole tech world in Europe is maturing very, very rapidly. So, I think we see uh, an, a huge number of companies compared to two, three years ago that are, that are considering 
using public markets and uh, are at that stage, whether US or Europe or whatever, that I think gives us all a lot of confidence about the, the, the depth of the market overall. So what I'd like to see is VCs across the board work with, realize that they, we need to build uh, markets here in Europe. So, and I think this realization is really sinking through, especially this year particularly, you know, at the, the government's level, at the ecosystem level, at our level, you know, where people are really investing now in building that up. And, I'd, I'd uh, and so I think, I think yeah. this, this, this is a really important thing. And I think everybody in the community needs to understand that they all need to contribute to this and so uh, to, to unleash the potential of, 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 frankly, of our countries. What will we, will we be talking about the same issues in five years', five years time, Salali? Look, I've always said Silicon Valley success has been because of a philosophy where everyone can be successful because success Success begets success. And I think we're going to see that success in Europe now. We've named a lot of the companies. There's a lot more in the pipe. And the next five years, you're going to really see the fruit of that. So it's exciting. Eric? I think it's the best five years ever ahead of us in the venture industry. Well, there you go. You rarely hear VCs quite so optimistic. But uh, um, thank you very much, everyone, for, for, for the panel. And uh, please thank uh, our uh, panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Fantastic. <laughs> Have a great web, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Albert. Thanks. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.